Hey, everybody, it's Tommy Canale, and welcome to Before the Lights Podcast, the show to find out how those in sports, music, and entertainment made their mark. Let's get this show started. Go get your coffee or grab a drink and sit back and relax. Today, we have the lead singer from a band that has a distinctive sound. Some say it's alternative country, while others label it as Americana. A country punk rock band that has a combo of soul, rock, and country. It's one of the hardest working bands in the last 10 years. They're from Memphis, Tennessee, and its members include Ben Nichols, Brian Venable, Roy Berry, John C. Stubblefield, Rick Steff, and Todd Bean. Joining me today is the lead singer from the band Lucero is Ben Nichols. Ben, thanks so much for being on the show. Man, I appreciate you talking to me. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Before we get going, I want people to visit my website, BeforeTheLightsPod.com, and go to the bottom of the page and click the Vegas.com banners to get the best deals in Las Vegas for shows, hotels, and vacation packages. Go to BeforeTheLightsPod.com and click on the Vegas.com banners. Ben, I want to give a shout out to Kurt Bowman out there in Streeter, Illinois. He's a huge fan and the guy who actually started the push to get Ben and Lucero on the show. So, Kurt, I appreciate the push. Yeah, I appreciate I appreciate it. Yeah, that's great to hear. Um, yeah, one thing Lucero does have is a pretty loyal fan base, um, which is which is nice. Might not be the biggest band in the world, but but our the fans we do have are pretty loyal. I would agree with that. We're going to take a journey and uh, rewind some time in your mind a little bit. What was your childhood like in Arkansas that revolved around music to get you started? Oh man. Um, yeah, I grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas. And, uh, I guess my, my family, uh, sold pianos and organs. My grandmother, uh, she grew up on a farm, uh, in all time Arkansas outside of Little Rock, but always enjoyed playing piano in church and stuff. Um, and so finally she worked her way through different businesses and worked her way off the cotton farm. Um, and ended up opening a piano store. So I was, uh, always raised around music. My father and my grandmother, my grandmother could play beautifully. Uh, my father could sell a piano, but couldn't play one really to save his life. And I'm somewhere in between. Um, I can't sell a piano, but I can play one decently. Um, but yeah, music was always there and instruments were always around. Um, but really it was my dad's, probably my dad's 45 collection. It, it, uh, that really got me hooked. I remember being three or four years old and listening to a little, it must've been like a little Winnie the Pooh 45, you know, player with the little popsicle sticks that kind of went danced up and down with the Winnie the Pooh characters. And, but I would listen to, you know, rock and Robin or rock around the clock or, you know, buddy Holly songs that my dad had on 45s. And that's when I knew that's when I really fell in love with rock and roll. It sounds cheesy, but yeah, I was three or four years old. How old were you when you actually started playing in bands or getting more involved into music? Uh, you know, that 11, 12, 10, 11, 12, fifth grade, sixth grade, junior okay. high. Um, you know, you, there was, I'm not sure exactly when the moment was. Uh, I think my friend down the street got an electric guitar and an amp for Christmas. And, uh, and I heard that sound. I was like, oh, that's how they, that's how they do it. It's an electric guitar that makes those. That's what I like so much. I just never really put it together. Um, I'd you know been in school band and heard saxophones and trumpets and pianos, but that electric guitar rock sound it kind of that opened it up for me. Um, and so he had a guitar, so I bought a bass guitar, and we started learning how to play songs. And you know you're yeah, eleven years old or so, um, and you get the tablature and you start teaching yourself these you know whatever, uh, Welcome to the Jungle or whatever U2 song sure. was popular at the time. Um, but, uh, so I was just playing bass mainly because I figured it was easy, one note at a time. Um, and I started teaching myself how to play bass and uh, and just kind of started immediately writing songs on it. Just, uh, you'd come up with little licks and little, you know, note patterns. And, and then you'd hum a melody over it and you're like, oh, I can... I think I can do this. So at a pretty young age, I started writing songs, you know, junior high. When did the move from Arkansas to Memphis happen? Ah, I graduated from uh, college in Conway, Arkansas. 
I got a history degree of all things, which I'm not sure if I put that to use or not. It's debatable. Uh, we've got some historical, historically based songs. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm getting my money's worth. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, but I graduated from school and, uh, had a big crush on a girl in Memphis. And, uh, at the time, you know, each town, and this is the mid nineties. And, um, I don't know, every town had its kind of punk rock club and its own little thing going with independent bands and, uh, you know, small bands, just local bands. And Memphis had its scene and Little Rock had its scene. And there was a little bit of crossover, not, not a whole lot, but enough for me to meet some folks from Memphis and, uh, yeah, ended up with a crush on a girl. And as soon as I could, I, uh, I moved there after graduation. So, uh, I moved there for a girl and that lasted for a little bit, but, uh, started the band and that's what kept me there. The band's obviously uh, outliving that much longer. Yes, that's for sure. Um, yeah, I had no idea uh, the band would last this long. That was, uh, you know, you're just hoping to find some guys, you know, to stick together long enough to maybe play a few shows and maybe put out a seven-inch record or, uh, you know, maybe go on a small tour regionally. Um, and then you kind of figure they're going to break up and they'll go their own ways and somebody goes off to school or somebody gets a job or somebody settles down with a girl. Um, but yeah, no, some, somehow we've kept it going for over 20 years. Talk to me about what was red 40 band. Oh yeah. That was the band in Arkansas. Uh, so that was my, uh, college days, I guess I was, uh, 18, 19 years old. Um, and that was a very kind of pop punk influenced band. Okay. Uh, Um, there were a whole lot of kind of West coast, uh, Bay Area bands that I was a fan of, um, you know, uh, kind of Green Day, Jawbreaker, uh, that whole kind of scene. Um, Green Day ended up obviously becoming hugely famous. Yeah. Um, but in the old days, they were just another one of the punk rock bands in that kind of California scene. Um, and Red 40 was kind of influenced by all those all those sounds. Um, and so we played just Little Rock, maybe a couple of shows in Memphis, um, maybe a couple other shows in, in Arkansas. But uh, we never really did too much. But but it got, I don't know, I got to meet a lot of other musicians. And I got to play a number of shows and kind of see how things were done. So I learned a lot in that band. I booked my first few shows with that band. And that's, you know, just calling local promoters in different towns and uh, trying to talk your way onto a bill. Sure. Um, DIY shows going on down at the Riverfront Park. The power was always on, so kids would just take a PA down there plug it in at the Belvedere is what they called it uh, and put on shows and bands started from out of state started calling uh, the kids in Little Rock and they'd book a show at the Belvedere. So there's no booze. There's no anything. It's just an outlet at an outdoor park. But I went and saw a whole lot of shows there over, you know, four or five, six years. Um, And I kept trying to weasel my way onto one of those shows and I never could get anybody to really pay attention. Uh, So I ended up, uh, booking my own show, calling the bands and putting on a show in the parking lot at the piano store in the back parking lot at the piano store. So I, I did it myself, uh, the first time. And then from there I got a little more attention and knew a few more folks and we were able to play a few more shows, but yeah, I had to put on my very first show my myself before anybody would let me actually play their shows. <laughs> Where did the name Lucero come from? Ah, it's it, unfortunately it's not too exciting. It's a, uh, my guitar player uh, was just keeping a scrapbook kind of, of, you know, phrases and ideas. And he'd gone through a Spanish English dictionary and uh, had written down a, a few Spanish phrases and Spanish words that he just thought sounded pretty that he might use in a story or that he might use uh, in those days, kids made zines. Uh, and so we had this list and we had booked our first show before we had a name. Um, so it kind of came down to the wire and you're like, Oh, we need something to put on this flyer. Um, and so we were kind of going through his scrapbook and, uh, and Lucero was one of the words he written down. None of us speak Spanish. Uh, (laughs) We didn't know it was such a common last name. Actually, we've met a whole lot of people now all across the country with the last name Lucero. Um, and we just weren't thinking that far ahead at the time. And there was no Google at the time. Uh, this is, you know, 97, 98, um, and if there was Google, we didn't have it. Um, so you just kind of pick a name and hope for the best. Um, and we thought it sounded pretty. And uh, luckily, we've been able to stick with it the whole time. 
early on, who is the band influenced by? Man, uh, there was a uh, early on. We were really quiet. Uh, we played a lot of three, four time, like kind of waltzes and like uh, really, really simple, but really, uh, I don't know, slow and quiet, pretty stuff. Um, and so I had wanted to do something that was kind of country influenced, which was the exact opposite direction of the red 40 band that I'd been in the, with the loud punk rock stuff. Um, I wanted to do something quiet, um, and more, I don't know. I was a big fan of Johnny cash, especially since he was from Arkansas and I was from Arkansas. So that was a big thing for me. I, um, I was always a Johnny cash fan. Um, and I liked his kind of straightforward songwriting style. Um, just with a acoustic guitar and a pretty simple guitar lines. Um, and, and not real flowery words. Uh, he could paint you a really, uh, detailed picture and tell you a really great story. So he was always a hero of mine. And then, uh, and Tom Waits was a huge influence Mm. on me in those years. Um, I, I would love to think that, uh, I could write that way, but I, I just, I've tried for 20 years and I can't write a song like, like he, he could, like he can still. Um, he had a song called uh, Blind Love that was kind of a countryish Tom Waits song. And that song in particular struck me. I was like, ooh, if I could be in a band that just played songs like this, let's do it. And that's kind of, that was the impetus for Lucero. Was the goal, okay, two questions. One, was the original goal just to play one show? And was your yeah. first show really in front of just six people? Uh, yeah, that's not an exaggeration. It might not be exactly the right number, um, but there a handful of people. Yes. Um, I think there was a Canadian punk rock band, a local Memphis punk rock band. And then we opened the show. Um, now we did, I know we played six songs. That's for sure. Um, that's all we had was six and we played every one of them and they were all really slow and kind of <laughs> sad. And we had no idea what this small punk rock crowd was going to, um, but they were very gracious. They were very, they were actually very kind. Um, there might've been a dozen folks there who knows, but you know, but half of those guys were in the other bands. So yeah, maybe around six. People. <laughs> um, and yeah, that was 1998, uh, in the Hewling warehouse. It was just a warehouse space that some kids lived in and they'd put on shows. Uh, it was right downtown, right, right, right across the street from the Lorraine motel actually down there in Memphis. Um, so yeah, we had very humble, humble beginnings. It has definitely grown. <laughs> Explain to my listeners what are the Lucero family block parties? Oh yeah, um, we started those a while back uh, in Arkansas. Actually, there was a promoter in Batesville who wanted to do kind of uh, an outdoor festival type thing um, that was kind of centered around us and our fan base. Um, but after a while, we ended up moving that to Memphis. And now for the last few years, it's taken place in midtown Memphis, uh, at a, at a venue called Minglewood hall. Uh, and we put up a big stage in the parking lot and basically it's a good excuse to have a big hometown show and invite a bunch of these kind of bigger bands that we've met out on the road. Um, whether it's St. Paul and the broken bones or turnpike troubadours, uh, or a Memphis band, North Mississippi all-stars. We've had a lot of really cool guys that really we should be opening up for, but they've been nice enough to uh, come and play our festival, uh, the Lucero Block Party in Memphis. Um, so it's kind of our, it's our biggest hometown show annually. Um, and it's just kind of a, I don't know, it's become our kind of birthday party every year. In 2018, it was your 20th anniversary for the show. Yeah. And the mayor named it Lucero Day. That's kind of cool. <laughs> it, it was awesome. That's one of the coolest things that's ever happened to us. Um, I think the story I heard was that uh, uh, a neighbor of Brian Venable, the guitar player, uh, I, b- I believe before the mayor was the mayor, uh, he was this guy's lawyer. Um, and so they'd just been, I don't know, acquaintances and had worked together in the past, uh, just in that capacity. But he was an old friend. He'd become an old friend. And so this guy just kept bugging the mayor, basically, um, until finally he relented and signed the piece of paper that declared, uh, I believe it's April 13th or 14th, Lucero Day in Memphis. Um, but that was uh, that's something pretty cool. You can take a picture of it and show your, show your dad. And say, yeah. look, look what I've done. It is pretty um, cool. 
Yeah, it's uh, it's nice to be noticed. Ben, on what album do you feel the band actually took the so-called next step? Man, uh, that's an interesting question. Um, We recorded kind of some demos uh, in the early years, uh, but we hooked up with our our buddies, Luther and Cody Dickinson, who played in a band called the North Mississippi All-Stars. Uh, and their dad was Jim Dickinson, who was a well-known producer. He had worked with Big Star and The Replacements. Um, he played piano on Wild Horses. Jim had a crazy kind of career. Uh, and he had a little barn down in Mississippi. Uh, and his kids were in this excellent band. And so uh, we ended up working with them on our self-titled record. And then our second record, Tennessee. Um, and we still play most of those songs to this day in, in the set every night. Um, that, that record Tennessee is kind of the one, uh, that folks still talk about. It's, uh, that's kind of the, it didn't necessarily, um, put us on the map. Uh, it's not like it was a major label debut or it's not like it sold a whole lot of copies, but it did, um, over the years, it kind of filtered out into the world. And, um, that's the one that, people uh, usually reference as their favorite. And it's, uh, it's the one that where we kind of made a mark. Um, even if it didn't make us famous, uh, we got a toehold that we could kind of expand from with, with the Tennessee record. Going to jump to 2009, 1372 Overton Park. Yeah. More of a rock and roll sound, which was a little bit different than what you had done previously. For sure. What was the thought process of when putting that one together? That was a big step for us. Um, we grew a lot as a band with 1372. I think that really um, got us going the direction uh, that we're still going today. Um, up until that point, we'd worked with, like I said, we'd worked with Jim Dickinson and uh, we worked with Dave Lowry from Cracker on a record. Um, but they had been very kind of hands off um, and they just, they were there and gave us a little bit of guidance, but basically just let us do what we do. Um, with 1372 Overton Park, that was the first record we, uh, did with a producer named Ted Hutt, uh, who'd worked with, uh, one of his biggest records was, was, uh, the, the Gaslight, he did, he produced those and along with a lot of other stuff, but he, uh, he really put us through our paces. He, uh, he came to Memphis. He lives out in California. He's an English guy actually, but he lives in California, came to Memphis, uh, a couple of weeks before we started recording. And that made a huge difference. So he was at rehearsal every day for a couple of weeks. And we had, we thought we had the songs pretty much. Um, but we'd get in the rehearsal studio with him and he would really deconstruct the songs. We'd take them apart and put them back together again one way and take them apart and put them back together again another way. And, uh, you know, you're like, all right, maybe take, maybe take the verse and make that your bridge and then write a new verse or take the chorus and make that, you know, switch all the parts around and see really what works best. Um, and then just with our, our playing, we've never been the most technically proficient players. We're not, um, I don't know. I, well, I take that back. Our, our keyboard player is brilliant. He's an amazing, uh, pianist and he's just a great musician all around. Big the rest of us are coming from a more punk rock kind of, uh, philosophy, <laughs> uh, where it's, you know, it doesn't really matter if you learn how to play, just if the passion's there, that's what we're counting on. But uh, Ted Hutt really made us focus on our playing as well and uh, really pay attention to that. So I, I credit him with uh, really kind of bringing us together as a band and making us figure out uh, how to step things up kind of uh, just professionally and make things sound a little bit more polished and, and uh, a little less punk rock, but, but in a good way. 2014, you guys put out a live record from Atlanta with 32 yeah. songs on it. <laughs> yeah, I think it's uh the LP is four LPs when you if you buy the vinyl version. And we played a couple of nights at uh Terminal West down in Atlanta. Um which happens to be the last live show we played before the lockdown with uh COVID. But um but yeah, we went in there and recorded uh and we put out yeah, a a really long um, live record. We'd never done a live album before. And so I, I guess we just felt like we had a lot of ground to cover. Uh, we had a lot of history that we wanted to kind of squeeze into this live album experience. Um, 
I don't know. I, I've got mixed feelings about that. A lot of people uh, have positive things to say about it. A lot of folks, a lot of Lucero fans ended up liking that record a lot. And it is a good starting place if you're new to the band. It kind of gives you a nice overview of our, you know, bits and pieces from our entire catalog over the years. Um, we did record it at the end of a, I would say like a three month tour or something crazy. And it's the last three days of a three month tour. So the voice is kind of shot and we're all a little bit tired and you can, I don't, it, the performances aren't bad, but they're a little, some of them are a little rough around the edges, but I guess when it comes down to it, it's a pretty honest portrayal of uh, a live Lucero show at the time. Uh, and it does cover a good bit of the catalog. So uh, I'm glad it's there. I'm kind of looking forward to making a new live album uh, with some more updated material on it. Um, and yeah, maybe we, maybe we'll do it the first three days of the tour and not the last three days of the tour. <laughs> you sound a lot fresher. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. The voice might hold up a little bit better that way. Your daughter, Izzy, how has she changed you and better yet influenced you? Oh man. Um, yeah, that's a huge change. I, my, uh, my daughter, Isabel is four now. Um, so I didn't get married until I was 40. Uh, I just did the band. Um, I kind of knew all along that I wanted to just get in a van with a group of guys and travel the country um, and play rock and roll shows. And that's exactly what I did for 20 years. Um, and so, you know, you'd have girlfriends and serious relationships here and not so serious relationships there. And, uh, but it took a while before I was willing to settle down. Um, so I got married at 40 and then Izzy was born when I was 42. Um, and yeah, having a kid, it's, uh, obviously it changes your life in numerous ways. Um, but it's, uh, I don't know. It sounds cheesy, but she gave me a reason to, uh, she gave me a reason to take care of myself <laughs> and, um, maybe throttle back a little bit on, uh, some of that just kind of rock and roll, uh, I don't know, lifestyle. Uh, of course I immediately fell in love with her and she kind of became the center of my universe. And, um, so yeah, I had a reason to quit smoking and maybe dial back the drinking just a little bit. And maybe, uh, I don't know. I think I was, uh, I was in the mood. I was ready to focus on a family life. Um, I've, uh, I've had a blast doing everything I've done with Lucero. Um, but I felt like I was missing, missing out on, uh, this other, this other part of life. And, uh, and so, yeah, she's really, she's, she's given me all that and it's, uh, yeah, I'm definitely healthier for it. <laughs> um, and happier for it, you know? Yeah. I was getting a little, those Lucero songs and the rock and roll stuff that'll, it'll wear you down. And so, yeah, she kind of brought me out of that. That's great to hear. Want to jump to your ninth LP in 2018 among the ghost. Almost yeah, that's uh, to favorite, me, like something completely different than what is previous of Lucero. In a way, uh, I think really we were just able to, uh, all the influences that we've kind of accrued over the years and all the records we've made, I think this one has elements of all of that. Uh, it's just maybe focused the best. Um, whether that's just finally maturing after you know 20 years together, uh, I'm not sure what it is, but something with that record really gelled. Uh, we were working with a new producer, Matt Ross Bang, uh, and we were working at Sam Phillips Studio in Memphis. Uh, so it was right, actually, literally th two doors down from our rehearsal space. Uh, so we're we're in our neighborhood. We're with a Memphis guy, and uh, we learned a whole lot with Ted Hutt. Um, but with this record, we kind of stripped it back down to we're just a five piece, uh, and so so it's a. Uh, I don't know. It's a really straight ahead kind of rock and roll record that we were really able to kind of fine tune the sound. Um, I like the writing on it. I like, I think the lyrics hold up. Uh, I, I think the lyrics are as good as anything I've written in the past. And, uh, and I think we just really kind of nailed the sound of it. I think it, it's a more consistent record maybe than some of the ones in the past. And um, yeah, I got to say it's my favorite so far. You spoke about Sam Phillips recording studio which is actually a service. Isn't that the old Sun Studios where Elvis and Johnny Cash and Roy Orbison recorded or no? It's, 
it's in the same neighborhood. Uh, this is this is the studio that Sam Phillips built after he sold Elvis to RCA. Okay, so it's it's like a few blocks away from Sun. Like if you go to Memphis and you go on the Sun Studios tour, uh, you go in the little room and it's just you know one room with a control booth at the end. Right, been there. So it's not much of a tour. They they start you in this corner of the room and they walk you to this corner of the <laughs> Correct. room. Correct, and then you walk to this corner and they walk to this corner and that's that's the tour, um, and that's still there. But uh, Sam, uh, when he sold Elvis, he took that money and uh, just a few blocks over uh, on Madison, he built Sam Phillips Recording Service. And he built that from the ground up. uh, And I want to say it might be the only studio in Memphis built originally as a studio. There's a ton of studios, but they're just they're built in, you know, a building that was previously there. This uh, this he built from the ground up. So it's got some weird. Uh, cave-like echo chambers built into the walls. And um, at the end of the hall, you just open the door and eh, it looks like you're in a cave. Um, and there's cables run into it. And just a speaker, a little speaker and a mic hanging from the ceiling. I don't want to give away all the secrets. But there's, there's these weird uh, little things. The, the lobby, uh, the foyer or whatever, is kind of, it's got its own sound. And the hallway upstairs has its own sound. And then there's a Studio A and a Studio B. And they have their... Uh, unique sounds, but he, he he was kind of a mad genius. And um, this building is still, they don't do tours or anything. It's just a studio. Um, And it's been in various states of repair and disrepair over the years. But uh, with Matt Rossbang, our producer, he's got an office there now and he's been kind of the main engineer there since uh, Roland Janes died. And uh, I don't know, he's got, they've got a nice thing going at Sam Phillips right now. It's a, it's cool. It's just, it's just like it was in 1960 when it was built, but uh, it's got a uh, a kid with I don't know an updated knowledge of technology that really has an, a good taste for what he's doing now and how to use this building properly. And it's just a really cool Memphis place to record. I was going to say, how cool was that to record an LP there? Man, it's great. Uh, you know, they did Sam the Sham did Wooly Bully there, um, and there's a there's a little bar upstairs and Johnny Cash would hang out um, and Jerry Lee and, you know, Sam, there's just, you can, you can just smell the Memphis on this place. It's got a lot of history. And uh, so, yeah, just being in there gives you a good feeling. And uh, that's, I don't know. That's one thing I like uh, about Lucero and being in Memphis, just getting to be a small part of this you know, musical history that is Memphis and the rock and roll history that is Memphis. And we're just, just being a footnote in that is, uh, is really exciting for me. You talked about, you've been working with Matt Rossbang on yeah. the, uh, among the ghosts, but he's also yep. working with you on the new LP in 2020. Exactly. We so, went back and did the new record, which is called when you found me. Uh, and we did it the same, the same place, uh, with the same producer. Um, this one's different because we're working uh, in uh, these kind of COVID times. Um, with Among the Ghosts, uh, we didn't do any pre-production. Um, we just went into the studio, set up, and started kind of jamming, I guess you'd say. And I had a few guitar parts, and we just try stuff here and there. And then we'd you'd do that for a week and then go away for on tour for a couple months and come back and maybe do another week. And while you're gone, Matt's kind of mixing stuff. He's like, ooh, this kind of came together nice. And it was always kind of a surprise. You'd come back in town and kind of hear what Matt had been working on. And you're like, ooh, I didn't think that was that part was going to work at all. That's, yeah, let's follow that. And so it came together real organically, but over a long period of time. We would probably were in and out of the studio for a solid year making Among the Ghosts, um, which has its advantages and disadvantages. But um, But with... Uh, when you found me, the new record that's coming out, um, we knew we wanted to work with Matt and we knew we wanted to do it at Sam Phillips. Um, but we, uh, we obviously haven't played a show since March, uh, not a live show. Um, we got lucky. We were on tour in January and February earlier this year. And I think our last show was in Atlanta on March 6th or 7th. Um, and then the lockdown happened. Um, and so we all just kind of quarantined. And, uh, man, I don't know if I saw those guys again until, uh, I went back down to Memphis to record 
when you found me in June or July. Um, and so I'd spent, uh, well, I'd spent time, uh, last year and then all this quarantine time just working on these demos. Um, and so the songs were very, uh, maybe overly prepared even, uh, this time going into the studio. Um, so I had a lot of demos that I just recorded here at the house. Um, and then we recorded the new record in maybe two weeks. Um, so it was, it was a very, it was a quicker experience. Um, but, but I, I think we captured a little bit of that same magic that we had with among the ghosts. Um, it's just such a natural environment for us there in, in Memphis, um, and working with Matt, uh, it's, so it's a different record than among the ghosts. Um, we get to go a few new directions. Um, but I think it's still got the same, I don't know, the same guts, the same kind of soul to it. When you recorded that, I was doing some research. Did you guys wear masks the entire time while you're recording? That- we tried to as much as we could. Yeah, we did. How um, difficult was that? Uh, it was, you got used to it. Just like, I guess everybody, at, you know, working wherever, um, has to get used to wearing a mask. Um, that was one of the stipulations of uh, the owners, um, the Phillips family, was that we, you know, we wear masks when we're in there, and we made it through, and nobody got sick. Um, but yeah, I would go and sing in the vocal booth, you know, with not, with obviously without a mask on. Um, but when the guys were recording out on the floor, or if we were mixing in the mixing booth, everybody was wearing a mask. Um, so yeah, it was uncomfortable and annoying, just like they always are. But it's what you got to do, mm-hmm. and. Um, I think everybody was just glad to be out of the house <laughs> at that point because um, we'd been quarantined so long. Everybody was just glad to be doing something. Um, so the mask wasn't that big a deal because you got to, you were actually getting to go to work again. So it was nice. What can your listeners, fans, followers expect from when you found me when it gets released in January? Ooh, um, it is another new direction. Um, Lucero is kind of known for every album being slightly different than the one before it never seems like we put out the record people are expecting us to put out. Um, with among the ghosts, like I said, we were back down to a five piece, uh, just, you know, guitars, bass, drum, and keyboards. Um, and we put a few extra sounds on there, but with, uh, with when you found me, we explored more overdubs and, uh, we used some synthesizer sounds. Um, and we used more, I don't know, I wanted it to sound like the radio I grew up listening to in the 80s. Um, and so there's, there's, there's some of those elements on this record, which is something we've never done before. Um, on 1372, we added a horn section, and that kind of threw some people for a loop. Some people love it. Some people are like, oh, that doesn't sound like Lucero at all. Um, and then you get rid of the horn section and people are like, where'd the horn section go? We love the horn section. <laughs> you can, you never make everybody happy. No. Um, but this record, when you found me, it sounds, it's kind of a nostalgia record for me. It sounds like the songs I grew up listening to on the radio. Um, not the punk rock stuff I discovered on my own later, but the stuff you listen to whether you want to or not when you're, you know, six, seven, eight, nine years old, riding in the car with your mom. Um, it's just the stuff you hear everywhere from, you know. I don't know, Tom Petty and Fleetwood Mac and I don't know, all that radio stuff. Uh, I wanted to take some of those, some of those elements and put on this record. So, uh, so it's a little different than the stuff from in the past, but it's kind of a, I don't know. It's, it's something we'd never done before that I really wanted to explore. And I had a lot of fun doing it. The first single is out, outrun the moon and you can pre-order the entire LP right now. When You Found Me is due out January 29th, 2021. Ben, what songs, one, two songs on this new LP, are you most excited about for people to hear? Uh, Well, that Outrun the Moon, I thought was an excellent first single. It's just, it's a rock and roll song when it comes down to it. And uh, I don't know, I I was real proud of it. Uh, Now, we're going to release a couple more singles over the next couple months before the record release. And, um, when you found me is actually a, a title on the on the record as well. It's a, I guess it's the title track, and that'll be the next single to be released. And uh, it's a very quiet song. It, it was recorded almost um, at first. I, I wasn't planning on recording it, and then late one night, I just laid down the acoustic guitar track. 
I'd written a bridge to it that really kind of tied it together. And, uh, and it became much more important than I thought it was going to be. And we ended up naming the album after it. Um, that's the next single. And, uh, I'm real excited for people to hear that just because it's such, it's kind of a ballad as opposed to outrun the moon. The first single is the rock song. And, and then the second single is a ballad. Um, and I'm real curious to see what folks think about those lyrics and the, the feel of that song. Um, but then the single after that is just straight up rock and roll. Um, and then you've got, and then you've got some other songs with the synthesizers that paint a real kind of cinematic picture. Um, that definitely you've got stuff that is a new sound for us. And I'm real curious to see what folks think about those. I'm very proud of them. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Cinematic's a good word for some of these. Um, at least that's what I'm shooting for. Um, my brother actually works in film. He's a writer director named Jeff Nichols. So I've gotten to work with him on some stuff. And I think maybe some of that has influenced us a little bit. I, uh, I, I listen to movie soundtracks in a different way than I used to. And I think some of that might be kind of leaking into the Lucero writing process, but uh, yeah, it's uh there's a lot there. There's a lot, whole lot of textures. And so I think, uh, I think there's a lot for, there's a lot for people to kind of dig into on the record. I can't wait for it to be released. I'm looking forward to uh, hearing it as well as it comes out. Ben, what's your biggest challenge been over the last 20 plus years with Lucero? Man, um, just kind of keeping it between the ditches, um, balancing any kind of home life and, uh, tour life, um, has always been a challenge. Um, and I don't know, some of the other guys, uh, have been married in the past. Uh, some are just recently married. Um, but everybody gave up quite a bit, uh, to just really focus on being on tour. Um, and I think for a band like us, that's, that was the only way we were really going to make an impact. Um, we weren't just going to get signed to a major label and, and all of a sudden sell a bunch of records and just be able to retire. Uh, we're more of a kind of blue collar. Um, and that's how we were going to, we were going to make a band that was sustainable. Uh, and so the guys, you know, we just weren't home a lot for a lot of those years and that takes its toll, like I said. Um, but we were able to kind of balance it just enough uh, to where we didn't, we didn't go off the rails too bad. How has living in Memphis influenced what you've recorded in the past and maybe influence you, what you're looking at going forward? Man, um, it's a good question. Uh, there's always been a lot of great musicians around town and there's always somebody who's just amazing is playing down the street, uh, you know, on any given night, um, being able to record with folks, like Jim Dickinson, uh, and the all-stars, um, just having a piano player, the caliber of Rick Steff, who's played on so many different records, uh, be willing to join your band as a band member is huge. Um, and then you've got these recording studios where, you know, we recorded three records at Ardent, which is where big star did their famous records. And, you know, a whole lot of ZZ top records were recorded there. REM recorded there. Tons of bands have, you know, everybody's come through Memphis at least. Um, so yeah, so it, it makes you, it makes you want to, uh, kind of, it makes you want to be part of the game. Uh, and like I said, I, I'm, I enjoyed just being a footnote in that, that giant history that is Memphis rock and roll. Um, and so it's just fun. <laughs> it's just fun, uh, you know, being on the bench even in that game. Um, I don't know. Now is it how it influences the music? Um, we've always kind of had our own sound, but we've always been very opportunistic. If, uh, you know, if you, you run into Jim Spake, who's been on, he's played saxophone on tons of records and you're like, Hey, would you want to go on the road with us? He's like, yeah, sure. And he's probably 20 years older than I am, but he hops on the tour bus and bam, you've got a horn section for a while. And then you make a few records with a horn section and then they kind of, he goes his own way and you don't have a horn section anymore. Todd Bean with the pedal steel he hops on board for a little bit and you have a more Western sound with the, with the pedal steel. And then he goes his own way. And Lucero just has, uh, yeah, we've been able to incorporate all these different sounds over the years and just kind of be flexible. And we've been able to do whatever we want. We've never been trapped in one uh, genre or one sound. And I, uh, I like that a lot. I think that's another reason why we've been able to do this for 
over 20 years uh, is each record can be a little bit different and you can take advantage of all these different uh, opportunities and folks that present themselves in a town like Memphis. With all the music you guys have done, is there a song you've previously recorded, but you keep finding yourself going back to it for one reason or another? Um, that just that we like playing live or that we want to re-record or uh, just just one of my favorites. Just one of your favorites that you just kind of keep going back to. Man, uh, luckily I've got a lot of those. Um, we, uh, I don't know. My, my personal favorite is uh, a song that is on, I believe it's on Women in Work, even though it kind of stands out. That, that record has a certain sound, but I Can't Stand to Leave You uh, might have fit better on Among the Ghosts or, or All a Man Should Do. Um, but that song, there's something special about that song. It's a love song, um, kind of a heartbreak song, but I wasn't dating anyone. I wasn't in a relationship at the time and I didn't write it about anybody in particular. Uh, but now since I'm married, I can't stand to leave you. Yeah, that song has a different kind of weight and a different kind of meaning to me. So, uh, I think I enjoy singing that song more now than I did when I originally wrote it. That's cool. The band's had really good success over the years. Question that I came to mind, and I was kind of shocked when I dove into this. Why do you feel it hasn't become more of a mainstream radio station listened to band? I think, um, I don't know. I think we've always been destined to just kind of be what we are. Um, there's only so much you can, you're not going to pretty us up much more than <laughs> what we look like when we roll out of the van as we pull into town. Um, I don't know. I've, I've, I kind of, I wanted to be a punk rock band. I wanted to be part of that kind of underground scene. That's, uh, and I've, I have to remember that sometimes that's, that's actually what I was shooting for. My favorite bands are those bands that were at the time alternative, um, that w weren't mainstream. Um, and sometimes I get upset or, uh, frustrated just that, you know, we're not making more headway with this radio station or we haven't sold more tickets in this market. Um, but then I, I realized we're actually, we're, we're making by just, we're making, we're making, uh, a living just fine. And I'm having a whole lot of fun and I don't have to deal with anything more than what I want to deal with. I've kind of got it on a level, uh, where I can be at home with my family and, uh, I can write exactly the songs I want to write and record them with the people I want to record them with. And I've just got a, we've got it. It's a balance, I guess, going back to the balance and we've got it balanced just fine. And, um, yeah, selling a, a few more records is great and selling a few more tickets is great. I'm sure my manager and my booking agent would like it if we would sell a little bit more of everything. Um, but really I've, uh, it's balancing the band and my life together. Uh, that's kind of been the main goal as opposed to just pushing the band and pushing the band, uh, further and further. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure if that even answered the question, uh, but, but that's kind of where, where we stand. Looking back over your entire career, are you surprised you have the following that you guys do today? It's always a pleasant surprise when I realize, uh, that folks are still listening to us and still buying our records. Um, there's been folks that have been with us since the late nineties, um, that are still coming to shows and that's huge. That's amazing. Um, and I'm always impressed, uh, when we go back to an, a town for the, you know, 10th or 12th time and, uh, and then there's brand new people there. There's people that just came on board. Um, so, so yeah, obviously you can't do it without the fans and, um, and I don't know. I hope that there's, I hope that they stick with us for a while longer because I'm not planning on going anywhere. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so yeah, it's always, it's always, it's nice knowing that folks are actually, I don't know, paying attention and actually listening to, to the music you're putting out. How do people connect with you and the band? I think it's a pretty personal thing. Actually, the lyrics are usually written from a very personal place. Um, they're straightforward. They're not too flowery and they're, I don't know. They just kind of lay it out there. Um, and I think maybe some of the fans have, uh, they've been able to relate 
toward the things I'm writing, uh, maybe a little more than I expected even. Um, and sometimes certain songs mean things to people, uh, that I didn't see coming. Um, certain things can, once the song is out there, it's not really mine anymore. Um, it belongs to the listener and they kind of make it their own. And, um, and when I've seen that happen, sometimes it's, uh, it's, it's a huge compliment and it's, that's the goal. That's what I'm shooting for when you're writing a song and a lyric. Uh, and it's, I don't know, it's nice to know that folks are connecting with this stuff. Um, so, so yeah, I think it's a very, Lucero might be different from some other bands in that it is such a, a personal connection with the listener, uh, in a lot of cases. New LP is due out January 29th, 2021. When you found me, make sure you go out and pre-order it. The new single is out right now. You can get that. This show has been sponsored by Reflection Bay Golf Club, located in the heart of beautiful Lake Las Vegas. Go to reflectionbaygolf.com. That's reflectionbaygolf.com. It's a top 100 course the public can play. It's a Jack Nicklaus signature prestige design that played host to the Wendy's three-tour challenge from 1998 to 2007. Ben, if you ever get out to Las Vegas, let me know. We'll, uh, if you're a golfer, we'll hook you up and get you around out of Reflection Bay. Man, that would be that would be quite a sight. Me on a golf course. <laughs> sure I appreciate the invitation. Um, it sounds good, and I appreciate you taking time out of your uh, busy schedule and being on my show. This has been fun. Oh man, I loved it. Um, I listened to the I listened to the Gary Parish episode not too long ago. Um, he's a buddy of mine from Memphis. Yeah. Uh, and I think he actually still uses one of our songs as his kind of intro music on his radio show. But, um, but yeah, I was like, oh, man, yeah, Gary Parrish did this podcast. Oh, yes, I want to do this podcast. So, yeah, <laughs> Love that. Me. <laughs> Love that. GP's a good guy. For he show is. notes, go to our website, beforethelightspod.com. Follow us on Instagram, at Before the Lights Podcast. If you want to become a sponsor, reach out to us, beforethelightspod at gmail.com. We'd love to talk to you about sponsoring on the show. Thank you for listening. I'm Tommy Canale. And until next time, everybody, I salute a chin chin.